Thank you, Tony. You read the brief well. Um, thank you, Reinhardt, for the invite. It's uh, IDA's first time at the, uh, the LRC. We're very really pleased to be here. Um, thank you also, Reinhardt, for suggesting to everybody that we have deep pockets. Uh, but thanks all to, uh, also to Antoine and Marion for proving that money is a poor motivator. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, for those of you who don't know who IDA is, I'm just going to give a quick overview of who we are, what we do, um, some of our activities in high growth markets, um, and the importance of localization for our work in a general sense, but, uh, but also in, in these markets, and uh, how our agendas might overlap, and this is, I suppose, with particular reference uh, to the fact that there's a lot of academic researchers here, and how IDA's work might overlap with your work. Uh, so we're part of the Irish government, 100% uh, funded. Uh, by the Irish government, we are the Irish government's agency for the attraction of foreign direct investment into Ireland. We've been doing it for 60 years. Uh, I use a lot of oil in ULA, so I look younger than 60. Um, we have about 250 people globally um, in about 19 offices and about 18 nationalities. Uh, our focus is really around high value manufacturing and high value services. Um, on the services side, everything from financial services to headquarter functions to localization and management of localization. Um, we also uh, work quite closely with their existing base of clients <coughs> to help them to continue to drive value from their uh, investment in Ireland to make sure that Ireland always remains relevant to them. Um, and uh, we also feed into government uh, in relation to influencing policy, uh, particularly most recently around uh, tax policy and tax policy supporting r and We'll dig into infographics as well. Um, so this, this infographic kind of captures what I was gonna put into 10 slides, but gives you an insight into the impact of FDI and you know, why we're given such government mandate to do what we do. Um, so depending on which economists you talk to, um, they say that each job created in FDI creates somewhere between 0.7 jobs or 1.5 jobs in the sub-supply space. Uh, as you can tell by the way I'm dressed, we're a little bit more conservative, so we take the 0.7 approach. Um, so there's about 150,000 people directly employed in IDA-supported companies, and then they create about another 100,000 jobs based on that coefficient um, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the economy. Um, last year was a record year, 30% 30 up on the year before in terms of investments and jobs created. Multinationals pay about 50% of the total corporation tax stake in Ireland and are accountable for about 60% of exports. So I suppose more than any other country, with maybe the exception of Luxembourg, um, we're quite heavily dependent on foreign direct investment as an engine of economic growth. Um, and in the current global economic climate, we're very much aware that we're not the only country um, that understands the impact of FDI in pushing economic growth. Um, so 2012 has been pretty good so far. Um, it's really been a year of reinvestment um, and with all of the hoo-ha in the press about Ireland, um, it's a great endorsement of the fact that the country has really turned a corner um, in the eyes of the international economic press. Um, people like Fujitsu um, engaging in a very, very uh, in-depth and high-level research and development engagement with, uh, with uh, Derry in Galway. Uh, people like EA uh, expanding their uh, support centre in Galway announced this week. Um, you know, an, a key game for the company, um, Star Wars The Old Republic, the company pretty much bet the farm on the success of that game and shows Ireland as the location to support that game outside of the US. And then people like Northern Trust uh, who announced 400 jobs yesterday for Limerick. So the western seaboard hasn't been too, doing too bad over the past week. Uh, so for IDA, the key growth markets um, would really be India and China from a market potential perspective. Um, Japan, um, you know, Japan is growing, believe it or not, uh, and we group it into the kind of growth market space because logistically it makes it a little bit easier for us to manage our Asia, our, our Asia pack um, activities. And a lot of the, um, the challenges in the market there and a lot of the requirements for Japanese companies are the same as the requirements for some of these other markets. Then for the, uh, the markets below that, we tend to uh, market directly from Ireland. So all of the top ones, we have representation. So we have uh, two offices in India, two offices in China, one office in uh, Tokyo, uh, and uh, a representative in Sydney. Uh, we have consultants working for us in, uh, well, one consultant working for us in Brazil, uh, one in Russia, 
uh, we mark it directly to Korea from Japan. And in case you're wondering what that flag is there, that's the ASEAN region flag. So um, Singapore, um, <coughs> Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, from an IDA perspective, it's really Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia on the Islamic finance side. All the other markets are still very much developing. And then the markets down below, we tend to market directly uh, from, uh, from Ireland. So we probably do about two or three blitz visits a year. And we work closely with the embassies. And um, the great thing about having an ambassador send a letter of request for a meeting is it always gets returned. I don't know if that's anticipation of Ferrer Roche, but uh, it's a very, very <laughs> successful approach for us. Uh, we have a pretty standard uh, market development approach as well in, in these growth markets. Uh, what we tend to do is spend maybe 18 to 24 months um, engaging with the market from here, getting a feel for the business, building a, um, a momentum and uh, a pipeline of business. Then we'll uh, try and find a consultant to represent us maybe on a third of a year, half year basis. And then as they build up the business, we increase their hours until it becomes a full-time person in market. So from zero to having a, an IDA office is about a three to four year cycle. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, emerging or growth markets, um, you know, it's been a hard slog so far. I think we've been on average about three years in all of these markets. Um, our conversion life cycles can be anything from two to 34 years anyway for investment. So um, the initial uh, projects or investments that we're seeing are quite encouraging. Um, I think for the people here today, uh, the company Brahman down on your bottom left, um, interesting company, um, small Indian localization company, uh, helping European content providers localize content to sell into the Indian market. And we're seeing a general trend in that space as well. People like Fujitsu on the R&D side, um, I don't know if many of you are aware, but the biggest M&A deal in the country this year uh, was done by a Sumitomo Mitsui when they bought the um, aircraft leasing operations or assets of uh, Royal Bank Scotland for $7.6 billion. I think you've got a footnote in the press. Uh, and then we have people like ICBC, the second biggest bank in the world, Aris Global, <coughs> Indian uh, pharma provision and software provider, HCL, one of the big in Indian outsourcers, uh, and Satir, a uh, bespoke Chinese manufacturer of infrared equipment. We're confident we'll probably have about five more before the end of the year that we can publicly announce. Uh, two high-profile Japanese and two high-profile Chinese. So uh, we're hoping to close out the year on a high. Um, our, our CEO uh, very kindly announced uh, the growth markets uh, target uh, to the world at large uh, about a year ago. Um, and he said that we have to hit 20% of all of IDA's greenfield business has to come from these markets by 2014. So non-negotiable, no turning back, and uh, the trajectory has to be like that. <coughs> so localization in terms of FDI and totally you know, from all markets, vitally important, uh, employs about 16,000 people um, directly um, in, in Ireland, uh, responsible for almost 700 million euros uh, of, uh, of GDP. Um, it's also a keystone function uh, as IDA goes out and tries to attract investment in Ireland. What you tend to find is if you can improve localization capability or language capability to support localization, you tend to get um, support operations as well, Q&A operations, um, supply chain, then you have the multilingual accounts, payable accounts, receivable type stuff, depending on what industry you're in. So, you know, for us, it's a gateway into a lot of other activities that companies can do in Ireland, and having that that profile or that lineage in localization for IDA means we can get a, get a much larger footprint of investments here. Um, it also facilitates international IP strategies. So um, for the uh, more uh, tax aware, or tax literate uh, folks here, um, through localizing content, you can essentially transform it and take it um, in value terms from your domestic market uh, transform it based on you know not just language amendments but also market specific amendments and almost turn it into new IP that can then be licensed out of a lower tax jurisdiction <coughs> like Ireland. So very much part and parcel of people's international IP and, uh, and tax strategies. And as I said, it's also it also a very good proxy for language capability in the country. In fact, that you know Ireland has been in the particularly in the enterprise software space the de facto localization uh, location. Uh, for the past 20 years really helps IDA's selling message. Um, 
you know, there are some trends out there that affect how we market or try and attract these activities. Um, they're unstoppable trends. We have to embrace them. Um, I think, you know, automations and um, you know, machine translation and AI certainly a big trend, but also creates huge opportunities, uh, particularly uh, as Tony pointed out in the area of customer support. Uh, I suppose it's both a challenge and an opportunity for Ireland because we have, you know, almost 30,000 people in call center activities in Ireland. A big chunk of those are multilingual, a big chunk of those are native speakers. So those native speaking positions could be under threat from more machine translation activities. It's not, it's not your fault, Tony. Uh, from, 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 from some of these you know, machine translation approaches uh, to more chat-based interactions with companies. But it also enables us to use the English-speaking base of resources that we have in the country to engage with multilingual clients. You know, when we're reaching 60% long-term unemployed in the country, you know, machine translation in uh, a, a support environment can be both a threat and, uh, and, uh, and definitely an opportunity. In relation to, to crowdsourcing, um, we're seeing some activity in this space, but um, as I was chatting earlier with Thomas about this, not, not everybody has the brand equity of Twitter. Um, and you know, it's always going to be a balance between keeping that community type vibe um, and also trying to make money. Um, and you know, for companies who, you know, in a post IPO scenario that are making, you know, join the five, six billion dollar club, are people going to continue with their largesse um, you know, doing translation work for free for highly profitable technology companies? So um, so that's one thing. So you know, we're not seeing crowdsourcing in, in a broad sense. We are seeing it for companies like Twitter. Um, like Symantec, you have more of an altruistic offering as well and protecting people uh, you know, as, they, as they browse the web. Um, but in a general sense, we're still seeing a lot of um, conservatism um, and you know, the traditional um, approaches to localization are still very much to the fore. Um, definitely seeing a move beyond language, um, particularly in the digital media space. Um, so a lot of the games companies, particularly in the free-to-play space, um, you very much see uh, translation uh, or say localization and culture specific localization as a way to create new content. Uh, you know, to give you an example, really when you think about it, something like uh, like um, Zynga Farm though, you know, all of their content that they monetize and that they sell to use essentially animations. Um, and you know, a strategy for companies like that is to create culturally specific or geo-specific animations to then drive you know further purchases. And this again also feeds into tax planning and IP strategies because you know if it is just animation and you are creating it brand new to sell to clients close to market, and if you're doing it in a country like Ireland, which is a low tax jurisdiction, you're essentially creating new IP from scratch in a low tax jurisdiction. And those activities are being undertaken in these companies by the localization department. So definitely a move for a broadening of the remit of localization beyond just, just language. Um, we're seeing some interest in you know, smaller providers uh, in providing cloud services for localization to support machine translation, cloud-based, building a bank of IP in terms of the databases um, and keeping them central in a location like Ireland, and then either selling the service or licensing out the, uh, the uh, database to, uh, to potential users. Um, in terms of opportunities in growth markets, again, people are quite conservative. Um, I don't think crowdsourcing is going to take off with the likes of Tencent or Baidu or Alibaba anytime soon. Um, uh, these companies are taking smaller steps into Europe. Their primary focus is market development. I think for the audience here, the main opportunities from a localization perspective coming from these markets will be in digital media uh, and to a lesser extent, cons uh, lesser extent consumer-based software. Um, I think all the other you know, uh, elements or sectors there we don't offer too much in terms of localization opportunities just yet. But in that space of digital media, stroke, games, um, these companies are taking baby steps first. So they'll come to Europe with maybe one title, see how that goes, maybe outsource localization and support to somebody else. If that takes off, then they'll build bigger. And then from my, you know, an idea perspective, we just have to work with them as they go through that process. The uh, US is marginally more attractive than the European market to these people at the moment, so I think they see more growth prospects there. Um, that's evidenced by the likes of Gree making a big push into Silicon Valley, the likes of Tencent 
buying huge stakes in the likes of Riot Games, um, and, and as well do licensing deals with the likes of Blizzard uh, to bring things like World of War, uh, Warcraft back into uh, back into China. Um, huge interest from Asia Pack in content acquisition and M and A. Um, you know, when you think about it, um, people are you know running for the hills in China at the moment because growth is only going to be seven point five percent. Um, so for a lot of Chinese content owners, the real opportunities for them are to acquire content in Europe and then license back into China. So from a localization perspective or a localization opportunity perspective, the opportunities are kind of counterintuitive in that the content flow isn't coming from uh, east into west, but it's coming from west back to east. Um, and you know, that's going to continue until growth prospects in Europe improve. Um, we need to build our profile in these markets as well. So we've got a great name in Western markets. As a localization center, we're starting from a zero base of awareness in, in many Asian markets. And, but we're encouraged by the potential. And you know, we're chatting to folks like Tony uh, in Vance Info and, and some of his peer companies as well. And, you know, they like what they see. In terms of how we can help each other's agendas, and this is from us as an IDA academic researcher perspective. Um, we can facilitate a lot of company involvement in your own research initiatives. Um, we work quite well at this. Um, Japan is probably leading the way uh, in terms of this at the moment. The likes of uh, Shimanzu uh, in NUIG, the Advanced Optics Group, Fujitsu with the Dairy Institute, um, Dynapon Print uh, with CNGL, um, and NEC with the, the CPR Research Center in Trinity. So big interest from Asian um, and deep growth markets companies in gaining access to academic ex expertise and sometimes pre-IP here. Um, you can do co-marketing. So most of the research centers here have a um, industrial collaboration agenda or mandate or target. Uh, we work quite well, um, particularly with uh, with Porig and his team in CNGL uh, on co-marketing trips and just expanding the network. So we have our network, CNGL have their network, and if we co-market the same message, it just broadens the agenda and, and, and spreads the net. Um, most of the advisory boards uh, for the research centers uh, that you're involved in have very serious decision makers from industries you know, sitting on them. Um, we're always happy to leverage your network to get our message across to them. And then with the existing base of companies here, so IDA is about just over 1,000 clients, uh, 600 of them are multinationals in Ireland. We have about another 4,500 live conversations ongoing, so it's a pretty big network. So we're always happy to broker introductions uh, to people who you think might be interested in some of the work that you're doing, you know, where there's mutual benefit. And then I suppose when you're out there marketing Ireland, sometimes you need to present the high, you know, the, the high level picture, the ecosystem picture, so we can provide you with some of the material to help you with that as you go out and engage with potential collaborators and peers. I hope I, I looked at the list of attendees. I hope I haven't left anybody's language out, so if I have, I apologize. Um, and then if anybody wants to contact me about anything there, um, that's my email address. Of course, you can direct message me on Twitter, most importantly, and uh, feel free to reach out and connect to me on LinkedIn too. Thank you.